Okay, so now let's get into the um, the new part of the course, which we started last time, and the, the, the so-called transition from a linear model to a nonlinear model started off first by considering, uh, by describing what was called the generalized linear model, and, uh, uh, and, and from which we then talked about what qua a quasi-likely approach to fitting a generalized linear model or something even more complicated than that that allowed for correlated data. So we talked about a generalized linear model, and basically what that's all about is it's, it's a way of writing a model that fits into the GenMod and even the, the Glimmix program, um, which allows you to, to specify a link function. And, and the link function does what? What does a link function do? What's the key purpose of the link function? When you write it in the code, when you're running a, a program, to um, consider uh, a generalized linear model or something with correlated data. The purpose of the link function is to tell the computer what, what model you're using. If you say link equal linear, then you do it using, using a linear model, and you don't need to really do that for GenMod and GlimMix because you've got ProcMix to do that for you, even though these other two programs will do, will do linear models also. And if you write logit, link equal logit, what are you doing? logistic model, and if you write link equal log, you're doing Poisson regression model. So those are the three main links. There are other links, but those are the three main ones that uh, we're going to be sort of playing around with in this course. Okay. And then, um, so that's, so this generalized linear model was a model that incorporated several different models in, uh, in a common framework. And when, when I talked about the general, uh, this, this kind of model, the generalized linear model, I talked about how if, uh, assuming that when you talk about generalized linear model, the, 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 the theory says, assumes everything's independent. And if you, assuming everything's independent and you've got a, a bunch of individuals, a sample, and uh, they, the sample has a response. You've got several response. You got a response on several people, and the responses are independent. You can come up with a likelihood function, and you can maximize that likelihood function, like we talked about even in the Epi 740 course. And when you maximize that likelihood, the way it works is you take a derivative, set it equal to zero. You get a, you don't do it. The program does it, and it comes up with a bunch of equations that gets solved to give you the maximum likelihood solution, right? That's how you do, that's how you do maximum likelihood. And one of the things I showed you when I was talking about um, uh, generalized linear model is that when you actually look at the mathematical form of the likelihood function, which I guess I can find here, um, might as well find it. Um, where is it? Uh, here. GLM, let's get that up here. Uh, where'd it go there? Nope. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So um, I'm just repeating or reviewing some things. When you look at that general form down here on the bottom of this slide here, uh, for a generalized linear model, the likelihood function, the set of score equations that have to get solved to give you the maximum likelihood solution, this general expression doesn't really even involve the distribution function for that for the model that you're dealing with. It only involves the mean and the variances of the of the um, of the of the distribution that you're dealing with. So this led people to uh, statisticians to think about well maybe if we don't even have we have a complicated situation where we don't really can't easily work with. Uh, the distribution of the outcome variable because it's too complicated or we don't even know what it is, maybe we could set up a set of equations that we could solve that only involves the mean and the variances providing we could figure them out for whatever, we're, whatever the, the outcome we're working with and we can get a set of equations that we can solve that are similar to the score, the score equations or the maximum likelihood equations, but they don't involve, they didn't start from a likelihood function. So these equations are called score-like equations, and when they get solved uh, through um, uh, assuming that the, the uh, outcome, the, the, uh, the observations on the different people in, the, in, the, uh, in your study are independent, 
then they're called quasi-likelihood equations, and when you solve them, you get what's called a quasi-likelihood estimate. And the quasi-likelihood estimate is it's not likelihood because you didn't start with a likelihood function, but you're doing something that's um, essentially very similar to what you would do uh, by solving a set of equations. And uh, as it turns out, the statisticians who worked with this idea of quasi-likelihood found out that the properties of these quasi-likelihood estimates were very similar to the properties of maximum likelihood estimates, particularly that in large samples, the estimates, the, the, the betas, the estimates of the regression coefficients are approximately normally distributed, just like you can say for if, if the sample size is moderately large, just like you can say for maximum likelihood estimates. So it allows you to do certain things when you do quasi-likely, very similar to maximum likely. But there was one thing you couldn't do, one thing you couldn't do when you're doing quasi-likelihood, and that was you couldn't do a likelihood ratio test, right? And why couldn't you do a likelihood ratio test if you're doing quasi-likelihood? You couldn't do it because you didn't have a likelihood. So you couldn't do, you couldn't get a likelihood function for one model and a, a minus two log and for each of two models subtract one from the other because you don't have a likelihood function. So you can't do a likelihood ratio test, but there, there, there are two tests you can do. One is a wall test and the other is called score test, okay? And you can do either one or both of those tests if you're doing quasi-likelihood. And of these two tests, that you can do, the one that has better statistical properties is the score test. So if you had a choice between the two, that's the one you should do, but they usually will give you similar answers, but uh, almost even the same conclusions, but if they give you different conclusions, the one you go with is the score statistic or the score test. That's the message we've said so far. Now, the only other thing about quasi-likelihood that I just want to re-emphasize is that you have to be able to say something about the mean and the variance of the random, the outcome variable, the response variable, the y variable that you're dealing with, you have to be able to say something about how the variance of that variable is related to some function of the mean. And you can usually say this for the most popular of the models that we deal with, normal, logistic, and, uh, and Poisson models. And you can say this with some other things, but that, that's the key requisite in order to be able to say I can do quasi-likelihood. So if you can say that there's a relationship between the mean and the, and the variance, particularly in terms of saying that you can write the variance in terms of a, this kind of a product where phi stands for a scalar and this stands for some function of the mean, then you can actually do quasi-likely and you can, get, you can get nice results, not exactly uh, maximum likelihood, but good good. Uh, good results similar to maximum likelihood because they're large sample norm, norm, normally distributed um, uh, estimates of the regression coefficient. So that's what quasi-likelihood was like. And so now, basically at this point, we're now ready. That's really all I wanted, wanted to say other than there are these two ways to do the test, the score test and the, and the wall test. And in, the, in this particular um, presentation, I actually go through the formula, uh, formulas for how the score test and the wall test, how you can do them, or at least the, the theory behind it, but you don't really need to know that unless you're doing theory, and most of you aren't. You, if, you're doing, if you're doing a project for the course and you want to run a model, all you need to know is the code to get the score test or the wall test, and that's what we're going to focus on as we start talking about these different um, uh, programs, GenMod and GlynMix, GenMod being the one we're going to do today. So um, with that, I want to start now talking about um, where we're going next, which is the GEE, and what do we mean by GEE? Okay, so that's what we're going to do. And then once we finish talking about GEE in general, we're then going to focus, and we're going to do this today, we're going to focus on the GenMod procedure and how it works and look at some examples and all of that, okay? So I want to talk about the GEE approach, okay? GEE stands for Generalized Estimating Equations, okay? And essentially what this approach is, essentially what it is, is sort of extending quasi-likelihood, the, the idea of quasi-likelihood, which in, in its basic theory assumes everything's independent, extends it to allow you to consider 
score-like or quasi-likelihood equations that deal with correlated data, that deal with repeated measures data, or it could be data that there's correlations because you're dealing with households. So um, that's what basically what the GE approach is. It's a way of expanding or extending quasi-likelihood to correlated data. So you, the, the score-like equations are a little bit more complicated because it involves putting into the model uh, matri uh, it involves writing matrices into the, into the form of the score equations, which again, most of you don't care about, won't care about, because the computer's gonna set those equations up and gonna solve them for you. So anyhow, background. For approximately normal outcomes, a large class of linear models is available to consider longitudinal or more generally correlated data, most members of which involve the multivariate normal distribution. But for non-Gaussian, non-normally distributed outcomes, the lack of multivariate distribution has resulted in relatively few approaches, uh, particularly for modeling discrete longitudinal data. Okay? So this has led to this extension of quasi-likelihood, which is called the GEE method, the Generalized Estimating Equation Approach. What is it? Here's a list of things, a list of its characteristics. It's a general method for fitting mathematical models to data involving repeated response measurements on the same subject. That's what, so you've got correlation. You're throwing that into the, uh, to the problem, okay? Responses, when you're talking about the GE approach, responses can be either discrete or continuous. If you're talking about the two packages that we're gonna focus on, the two programs we're gonna, the programs we're gonna focus on, GenMod, is, a, is a, uh, a, a way for doing the GEE in which no random effects are allowed. So you can only do gen mod assuming that you've got fixed effects. So it's a limitation, but there's some things that uh, you may still want to use gen mod that gen mod has some characteristics that uh, the other package called Glimmix, which allows random effects, but doesn't actually have some things that gen mod has. So uh, and doesn't have some, there are some issues about Glimmix that may, may make you want to think about using GenMod any, anyhow, instead of, or in addition to Glimmix. So um, in any case, these are the two programs we're going to learn about. Um, it allows the user to account for intra-subject correlations. Another way, all I'm saying here is GE method allows you to deal with correlations that you, deal, that, that you have in your data often treated as nuisance parameters. When I say that, when I use the term nuisance parameter, correlation's a nuisance parameter, what do I mean? What do I mean by, when I say the correlation and when you're focusing on it as a nuisance parameter? What it means is, you're not necessarily really interested in knowing this correlation structure exactly, but you wanna take it into account. You know that if you don't take it into account, you can get the wrong answer. You can get a wrong estimate or you can get a wrong uh, test of hypothesis, confidence interval, that could be incorrect if you don't take into account the correlation structure. But you don't necessarily want to know exactly what the correlation structure, you want to make sure you take it into account. You want to be able to take it into account in a reasonable way. It may turn out that you can take it into account using one kind of correlation structure and take it into account using another and you'll get essentially the same conclusion. So it didn't really matter that you knew exactly what the correlation structure as long as you're pretty uh, satisfied with that you were able to take correlation into account. So that's what I meant by it's nuisance. It's something that's in the way. You might not really want to know about the correlations other than making sure you're taking it into account. Different, uh, just like in, in um, when you're dealing with mixed uh, uh, or continuous outcomes, different subjects can have different numbers of repeated measurements and they could be at different times. Now, the more you have that kind of situation where you have an unbalanced data set, the more it gets difficult to make these programs work or the programs don't work as well. You have an unbalanced data set, you try to run a certain correlation structure with a certain model, and it bombs, it doesn't run, or you get an error message, or you get quasi you know, this non-positive definite answer or something like that. And if that's the case, uh, when you, it, that, which frequently happens with unbalanced data, you have to make compromise and try to get a model that runs. So that's what I meant by that. Uh, correlations are specified in the form of a working correlation matrix, which can have a variety of possible structures. So when I say working correlation matrix, what do I mean? What do I mean by that? Well, again, I'm just throwing stuff out here and then I'm gonna try to answer it. Somebody could answer it if they want to, but eh, I'm looking at Kate. Thought you were gonna, nah, you don't wanna answer. 
Uh, okay, so when you talk about a working correlate, you're just saying that when you start out trying to analyze your data and you're trying to use one of these programs, GenMod, Glimix, or even Mixed, you have to tell the program in the code what correlation structure you're using. Okay, so that might, might not be the right one. So that's one you're trying out. One that you're trying out where, for a reason that you think might make sense. It might make sense if there's a, if it's a longitudinal study, it's being, people being followed over time, that you don't want to assume the correlation structure is exchangeable because you're assuming that that, that me, exchangeable means it doesn't matter how far apart uh, observations are uh, uh, on the same person, uh, all the correlations are the same. So you might not, so, so it, all I'm saying is you're starting out when you're running, uh, doing your analysis with specifying correlation structure, but you might want to modify what you're doing. You might have several working correlation structures, or you might want to make some decisions about what you think the real correlation structure is, having started with something to begin with, okay? And the user can choose from a variety of model forms specified by specifying a link function, this generalized linear model framework. So you can fit a lot of different models, just what I'm saying, using the generalized estimating equation approach for correlated data. And the model parameters are estimated by iteratively solving a system of equations based on quasi-likelihood methods rather than rather than uh, uh, maximum likelihood method. That's the idea. That's what generalizes. So, so okay, so now let's talk about, well, what does the basic data layout look like if you're doing generalized estimating equations approach? And this is a data layout I showed you already when we were talking about the, the, a linear model uh, and we were looking at a proc mixed and how to fit linear models. It's the same data layout. If this is the way I'm sort of, uh, I, the way I describe this, this is the way I'm listing the uh, clusters vertically. In other words, the first cluster, I get all the observations in the first cluster, and then I go on uh, the uh, next cluster and so on. This is the ith cluster, and this is the last cluster that I'm referring to as the kth cluster. And, uh, and that's a general framework where if um, you've got a longitudinal study, one of the predictive variables, or one of the variables you're certainly measuring is time, so you might want to keep track of that. You might even want to have that in the model. It might be one, one of the x's, but you've got, certainly you have an outcome, your, your y variable, which you assume, your response variable, which you're assuming is changing from one time to the next, or from one repeat to the next, or from one person, if, it's a, if you're talking about households, from one household member to the next household member. And then you've got your predictive variables, and the predictive variables, just like they, they were even when you're doing uh, logistic regression or Poisson regression, they could be exposure variables, con uh, confounders, or potential confounders, effect modifiers, and they even can be, if you're talking about this kind of weird model that it's not a great solution, or there's a number of different ways to solve this, this um, what's called a conditional or transitional model, where one of the x's is a previous value of y, you can, an x can be a previous value of y. When you might want to do this, and how to do it is a little bit um, nebulous, so even though there are some ways to do it that I briefly described. So that's the basic lay the day out, and, uh, and then again, um, you can decide on a G approach typically considers the non-independence of responses with subjects as a nuisance, and this makes the basic focus of the model one on marginal expectation, but um, uh, depending upon the, the program you have, you, if you're using Glimix, you can even have random effects in there. So, um, so anyhow, uh, so you could have earlier values of the Y, and then that would be a conditional or transitional type of model, but main, main thing I'm trying to say here is uh, if you're um, doing the GE approach, you could have marginal, conditional, or even random effects models if you have a program that allows for random effects. That's what this says. Now, here's where I want to spend a little time talking about working correlation structures. And wh what do we mean by that? And again, what I mean by that is that's the way you start out when you're trying to do your analysis, trying to specify in a code that you're running, uh, in a computer program that you're running, what you think the correlation structure is, and you want to see what kind of results you get and, and try to conclude something about your study question. And um, I'm using the um, notation C, capital C, with bold, uh, bolded C for correlation structure, okay? And that's standing for the working correlation structure C sub I's for the ith subject. 
So if the ith subject in your study has four repeated observations, then the, the correlation structure, the C matrix is going to be a four by four matrix, right? Because it's going to have four rows and four columns for each of the four observations on that subject. Okay, now the the different the thing that's a little new about what's on this screen here is I'm describing this working correlation structure as C sub I. Now again, this tilde underneath it, what's the tilde for? That's just to tell you, I'm talking about a matrix. If I did, if uh, the tilde doesn't have to be there, as long as you see a bold letter, you're talking about a matrix. Okay, but the the, the thing um, where it says C I and then it's got parentheses alpha. Alpha is the new thing, the new kid on the block in terms of what I'm putting on the screen here. What do I mean by alpha? Okay, alpha is stands for a vector or a, a collection of parameters that satisfy the requirements of a correlation matrix. So we got to talk about well, what do we mean by alpha? Okay, and it's really not hard. We don't need to talk about that. Uh, but in any case, um, it's important that. Uh, the C matrix can be of different sizes for different subjects, right? If you, somebody has four observations, the C matrix will be four by four. If somebody has six, it'll be six by six. And corresponding to the correlation matrix, there's a variance-covariance matrix. Because you can go from the correlation to a variance-covariance co variance or from the variance-covariance structure to a correlation because there's a formula relating correlation to variances and covariances. So in the um, terminology that we're going to work with, that variance-covariance matrix is going to be called W. That's, what, that's going to be called the working covariance matrix. Now, when we're using, when we're talking about um, uh, the uh, FE, uh, when we're talking about the, the linear model, the, we didn't use W. What did we use instead of W for the working covariance matrix? We call it V. V for variance. So, so W is really the V. Is another is, is another way I could have written V, but this is the the literature in the uh, on this is usually uses the term W. So W stands for the working covariance matrix, and because of the relationship between covariance and correlation, there's a way you can go from a covariance to a correlation, or or the other way around. And there's a matrix way you can write that. And back way back number of um, several weeks ago, I wrote a formula for how you can go from one to the other. But uh, it's not that important because the when you tell the computer what you want, you're going to specify it either as a covariance or a correlation matrix. But there is a way to go from one to the other. But here's what I now want to get to. Here's a list of co correlation structures that you could use. I want to talk about some of these. And I want to talk about some of these in terms of explaining what this alpha means, what this set of parameters means, okay, in terms of describing the correlation structure. Okay, so first of all, uh, independence, you, we know that correlation structure means you're assuming that there's no correlation. If you've got six observations on a subject, you're assuming they're completely uncorrelated. That's why there's zeros on the off diagonals, ones on the diagonals. If you're talking about an exchangeable correlation structure, we've already done that many times, we're talking, we're talking about making the assumption that the correlation between uh, any two observations on the same subject is the same. It's equal. That's they're exchangeable. It doesn't matter which pair of observations we're talking about. Now, if you think about an exchangeable correlation structure, how many parameters are there that you have to estimate? If you're talking about an exchangeable correlation structure, what's it look like? It's got ones on the diagonal, and it's got on the off diagonals, it's got some correlation, right? And that correlation is the same, regardless of which, whether you're talking about the correlation between one and uh, first and second, first and third, second and third, and so on. So how many parameters are we worried about? In other words, in order to specify an exchangeable correlation structure, how many parameters do we have to know or specify? If we assume, if we assume that for every subject, it's the same parameter, even though the, the the subject may be, one subject may be four by four, have four observations, another may be six by six. How many parameters? One row. There's only one parameter, okay, that we're talking about. Well, in that case, in this, for an exchangeable correlation structure, alpha, this alpha vector, 
is really not even a vector. It just represents the one parameter that you need to know to specify the correlation structure. It's only that one row. If you know row, you know the whole correlation structure. So it's a it's an S by one vector, but what's S? What's an S by one vector where S is equal to one? See, in other words, all you need to know is the correlation, the single exchangeable correlation, and you know exactly what an exchangeable correlate, what the exchangeable correlation should be. So that's what alpha is in terms of an exchangeable correlation structure. Okay. So what about some of the others? Well, let's skip the stationary thing. Let's talk about. I'll, I'll do this afterwards. But autoregressive. We learned about autoregressive, right? That's the correlation structure where if you have um, uh, equally spaced observations, uh, the first, second, third, fourth, uh, the, the time between observations is the same, then the correlation goes rho, rho square, rho cube, right? Okay, for that correlation structure, okay, how many parameters do you need to specify in order to know exactly what that correlation structure is? How many parameters do you need to specify? 10, 15, 1? Only one. All you need to know is that row. If you knew the row, then you know the whole correlation structure, but you know that it's autoregressive. So an autoregressive correlation structure, for that structure, what's alpha? And what's S for that alpha? Alpha is just a scalar, and it's just the common correlation that you only, this is the only thing you need to specify. You'll know exactly. So that's what we mean by alpha. It's the number of uh, the specification of the parameters that we need to specify in order to be able to say we know what the structure looks like. Okay. So now, uh, in, a, in a different case, what if we're talking about an unstructured correlation matrix? And suppose everybody in the study has got four observations, an unstructured correlation matrix four observations. What's alpha? What's alpha in that situation? Is alpha just a single number, a single correlation? It's all the correlations on the off diagonal because they're all allowed to be different, right? So alpha now consists of the correlation between the first and the second, the first and the third, the first and the fourth, the second and the third, the second and the fourth, and the third and the fourth because that's all you can get if it's four by four, okay? So what you need to specify if it's unstructured is a, what a if, if uh, in that particular case, four by four, S is sick. One, two, one, three, one, four, two, three, two, four, three, four, S is six. There are six parameters that you need to specify in order to be able to say what the correlation structure is. So that's what you mean by alpha. Alpha represents how many parameters you need to specify oh, is the collection of parameters you need to specify. It's just a way of saying what the underlying basic part of the correlation structure is that you need to know in order to be able to specify it. Okay. You got that? Okay. Now, yes. Question. Good. Would alpha then be referred to as fixed or is alpha just a cumulative length of alpha? Well, if, if, you've got, if you've got a study where people can have different numbers of observations, okay, then you, you, the way you have to specify alpha in a way you might say, what's the largest number of observations anybody has? So let's say nobody has more than 10 observations, okay, then the, and, we're, and if we're concerned about an, a, a, an unstructured correlation, we want to say, well, what is the alpha for an unstructured that would allow somebody to have at, as much as 10 observations? And we're talking about all the different, correla different correlations that you can get for a 10 by 10 matrix. That would be what alpha is. It's a list of all the parameters you'd get in the 10 by. If it's 4 by 4, you don't have as many. But the total number of parameters you'd have to specify, if the maximum number of observations is, is 10, would have to do with a 10 by 10 matrix. Am I answering that? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so um, let's see. Now, um, anything else? Any other questions? I got more to say here about this. But because uh, the thing I want to introduce is I, I kept saying something about it, but I want to introduce this one called stationary. Stationary. What that means. Okay. And I have said something about it. I've said something to individuals, but let's talk about that. We'll, we'll, we'll use some examples, but let me just define it here. 
Stationary is, is, for one thing, it's an alternative that people like to consider alternative to autoregressive when you've got longitudinal data. Okay, now we'll, we'll see why. What it says here is correlations, k occasions apart, are the same for different k's, uh, whereas correlations more than m, for k going up to m, correlations more than m occasions apart are zero. So let's let's uh, that's a little gobbledygook. So let's look at an example. Let's look at, at two examples here. Okay, this is exchangeable, but we're, that's not doing it. Okay, let's look at stationary. Let's look at this one. Stationary, then when you talk about stationary, you talk about stationary M dependent. Stationary M dependent. And there's another word for stationary if you're using mixed or glim mix, and that's toplets. So there's toplets M dependent or stationary M dependent. Two words for saying the same thing. It's just that stationary is what's built, the stationary is the term that's built into um, Genmod. So let's talk about, look at this correlation structure. Look at this correlation structure. What does this say? Is, first of all, is that correlation structure at the bottom of the screen, is that exchangeable? Is it exchangeable? No, right? Is it unstructured? No. Is it autoregressive? No, it's none of those. But what, what, does it ha what, what is this saying? It says, Correlations that are one unit apart are the same, right? If it's the, and this is somebody, this is somebody who has four observations. So correlation between the first and the second, second and the third, and the third and the fourth is the same. And, the, and that particular value is called row one. That's that. Correlations more than one unit apart, what is this assuming? Zero. So once you get beyond a K, a, um, immediately proceed, immediately uh, uh, observations that are adjacent to one another, once you get beyond that, the correlation is zero. Okay, that's what this is saying. That's what, and this is called stationary one dependent. Why is it called one dependent? What, where's the one? Because once you get beyond one, you're saying everything is zero. So what do you think two dependent would mean? Once you get beyond two, everything is zero, but you're going to allow them to be different for one and different for two. Here's two, two, two dependent. Look at this one. Look at this one. You can see that this would be stationary. Why this might be called stationary two dependent? Because if you're adjacent observations, one to two, two to three, they're all the same, row one, right? If there are, if there are more than, if they're not adjacent, but there are two occasions apart, this is one to three, this is two to four, this is three to five, right? Then they have a second correlation, okay? And yet, what's this one? What is this the correlation between? First and the fourth. This is the first and the second. This is the first and the second. This is the first and the third. This is the first and the fourth. So first and the fourth, is, uh, and the fourth are more than two occasions apart. That's why you would call this... Um, stationary two dependent, because once you get beyond two occasions apart, correlation zero, okay? So um, that's an example. So what would be um, three dependent? What would be three dependent if it's four by four? What would you have to do to change this? What would you have to do to change what I wrote here? I'd have to put in a row three here and a row three over here, right? But what about this one? It would still be zero. Right? Correct? Okay. So that would be stationary three dependent. Okay. So now, if you think about it, how is this sort of similar, but not exactly the same as autoregressive? Well, let's go back to the first one. Let's go back to the first one. How is this sort of similar to autoregressive? In what, in what sense would this would be very similar to autoregressive? Autoaggressive, where you had row and then you had row square, row one and then row one square. If the row is really small, then the square of that's going to be even small. And if the square of that is very small, it's almost like saying, like, well, once you get beyond, you know, uh, occasions that are next to each other, 
the correlation is essentially zero. That's what this sort of stationary one dependent is. It's sort of like autoregressive where the correlation is small. That's what it's saying. You see that? And this is that, this is that too. This is the correlation where the correlation, this is the like uh, autoregressive where the correlation is small, but it's not quite as small as it might be assumed if we're stationary one dependent. So it really gets small once you get three occasions apart, not two occasions apart. Isn't that what that says? So this is sort of, so people like, consider, like to consider stationary because it's similar to autoregressive, but what, what, what's the nice thing about it? What's the, you might say, I don't know if it's an advantage about it. What's an advantage of it? Well, you're not forcing it to be rho, rho square, rho cubed. You're letting it to be different but not exactly the square of it. So that's why people like stationary, okay? You get that? That's why stationary is often, often preferred. Now, let me ask you this. Suppose we consider um, stationary five dependent. Station, well, no, sorry, stationary four dependent. This, if we we're talking about this was stationary two dependent, stationary four dependent would look like what? What would it look like? How would I have to change what I've written over here? I'd have to put in a row three over here and a row four in there, right? That would be a stationary four dependent structure. And so if I had a study where everybody had four observations and I said, I'm going to assume the correlation structure is stationary four dependent, that's what it would look like. Instead of the zeros, we were, the, these two zeros and the corresponding ones on the op opposite side of one would be row three and this zero would be row four, okay? Now let me ask you this, is, is a stationary four dependent correlation structure the same as an unstructured correlation structure? Why is it different? Unstructured says everything's different, right? It doesn't allow, unstructured allows this thing to be different from this thing. It allows them all to be different. So a stationary four dependent, or whatever it is, could be 10 dependent, whatever it is, is allowing, is not unstructured, but it's allowing you to have different correlations at different uh, occasions apart from different, different observations, okay? So um, it's not unstructured, okay? Now, why do you think people like it for that. I mean, one reason why people like stationary is because it doesn't force it to be row, row square, row cube. Another reason is that if you're not sure what you want it to be, you could make it the maximum, if it's four by four, you can make it stationary four dependent. And you recognize that it's not unstructured. It's structured. It's more, I mean, unstructured structured, but it's structured to be everything's different. Stationary four dependent, if it's at four by four, everybody's four by four, is structured and it's not unstructured, but it has an advantage over unstructured in that it's simpler, right? It's simpler. And the other advantage is that unstructured often doesn't run. In other words, if you have unbalanced data, it may turn out that when you try to run the data because of the unbalanced thing, you may get an, an error message or you may get this thing about non-positive definite G matrix or something doesn't work for the unstructured, but it may turn out that um, a stationary M dependent, whether it's one dependent, two dependent, or four dependent, that may run even if an unstructured one doesn't run, okay? So that's why people like to consider stationary because it's, it's sort of an alternative to Un, to, it's alternative to uh, autoregressive, and in a way, it's a, it's, a, it's a compromise when you try to do unstructured and you're not getting results. Okay, that's what I'm saying. You, you got that? So that's, it's, a, it's a very popular uh, structure that people use. In fact, they're using it more in the environmental sciences occupational health department than they are, um, uh, than, than they are using autoregressive when they've got longitudinal data. You got that? Okay, so, okay, now, there's one other thing I want to talk about here. I've got this list. Now, you see arbitrary numerical specifications? See that? What do I mean by that? Correlation structure arbitrary. Well, you can, for any of these programs, you can do this for 
mix, gen mod, and glim mix, you can actually specify a correlation structure with numerical values for the correlations. You can specify numerical value. You can say, I think, not only do I think it's exchangeable, but I think the exchangeable value is 0.5 everywhere. Or I might say, I think it's autoregressive, and it's autoregressive so that it's 0.5, and then 0.5 square, and 0.5 cube. You can do that, or you can even have an unstructured correlation matrix where they're all different, but they're numerically different. That's allowed too. Now, if you specify that, if you tell the computer that and you, in the code, you say, I want it to be, I want it to be a specifically numerical uh, specification, what's going to happen is the computer will run that. With that spe it'll say, let's assume that's the correlation structure. Now, if you're worried about that that's wrong, what might you do? How might you correct for that or adjust for that? We talked about that already. What might you do? For any correlation structure, whether it's, in the, whether it's exchangeable, stationary, or aggressive, what can you always do, regardless of how you, what you specify? You can always use what's called empirical. empirical. I knew you had it on the tip of your tongue. You can always use empirical to try to correct for the fact that maybe it's the wrong correlation structure. Okay. Now, often people use arbitrary when they've got some kind of problem where, you remember I gave that example about um, uh, bypass, we're going to look at bypass studies very soon, but a bypass study where um, you had uh, people getting bypasses and after one year you would look to see if the bypasses were blocked and then after six months you also look to see if the bypasses were blocked. So there, were, there was sort of a, there was a longitudinal part of the correlation structure when you talk about from six months to one year and then there was a cross-sectional part of the correlation structure. We talk about what's happening in one year or what's happening in six months. Well, it could be that to uh, reflect the fact that the correlation structure is a mixture, you might try a numerical correlation structure that you might think reflects that. Now, I don't know exactly how you're going to do that. And one way you sometimes do that is you run the, the, you run a certain correlation structure one way, you run another one, you look, or you look at unstructured, you see what you got and come up with something as a compromise with different runs you have when you get estimates of the correlation structure. So all I'm saying is arbitrary correlation structures can sometimes be determined as a compromise when you're not sure what to use. It could be, uh, or when you've got a, a more complicated correlation structure than something that's sim simpler where you can say, I think it's, it's, long, it's clearly longitudinal and there's no cross-sectional part of it or something like that. So arbitrary is, is often used for that, for that reason. So these are the different correlation structures. Now, so that's what I've just sort of done here, stationary and so on, autoregressive and arbitrary. And here's an example of an arbitrary correlation structure. Now, is this, a, is this an exchangeable arbitrary structure? Is it an unstructured arbitrary? It's an unstructured, or everything's different, right? So uh, wh why would I want to do that? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, I might figure out something that may make sense depending upon some earlier runs I did on the model and earlier ways I got answers for what I thought the correlation was. I might want to put this in, see how this does, and then use empirical to see what happens, see whether it changes things or not. Okay. Now, so, okay, so, so, you're using GEE, what you're doing is you're, it differs from quasi-likelihood in the sense that you're now dealing with correlations. And, you're, you, and because you're dealing with correlations, you have to worry about a correlation structure, and you really have to worry about the fact that the model is now more of a matrix model because of the fact that you're dealing with repeated measures on subjects, and you have to consider the vectors that you're dealing with. You've got several observations on each subject. So it's, more, it's a more complicated model in the sense that you have to deal with matrices. But even though it's more complicated, the model is still, it's still the same idea. It's still the same idea. If you're talking about the GEE model, really what I'm giving you is the model for GenMod, uh, basically what you're doing is, basically what you're saying is, the model is a model for the expected value of y where you're specifying a link function and a variance relationship that spells out the model. Now, you notice I've written here e of y equal to g inverse x prime beta. What's g inverse? What's g? 
What does G stand for? So down here I say G is the link function. G is the link function. So what's if G, so what, is it, what do we mean by the link function? The link function is the function that takes the mean of the data and transforms it into the linear part of the mean. Of the, so if you're talking about, for example, a logistic model, logistic model, and, you, and, you, and we know the link function is the logit link, the link function is the logit link, okay, mu over 1 minus mu, so what's the what's mu? If the link function is a low logit link, what's mu, what's the what's the value for the for the expected value of a logistic model? It's one over one plus e to the minus a linear sum. That's what it is. Okay. So g inverse u is another way of saying if g is the is the way you go from the mean to the linear part, g inverse u is how you go from the linear part to the back to the mean to the to the formula for the model. So G inverse U is another way of saying, uh, it's called the inverse link, but um, given the link function as a function of the mean and assuming that G of mu is a linear function, then G inverse this uh, linear function is turns out to mean. It solves this for mu as a function of, of, the, um, of the linear part of the model. So if you're talking about a logit link, and the logit link says that the log of mu over times 1 minus mu is x prime beta, then the inverse link is what you get when we take this expression and you solve for mu. And what you're going to get is the logistic model. So the inverse link is just another way of saying what the model is, it's where the link, the link function is how you get the linear part of the model, and g inverse is how you get the actual model by going from the linear part to what the what the mean value is. It's not that complicated, but you'll, you, you may have to work with this a little bit to understand it. Now, what's this? It says, the generalized estimating <coughs> equations. So what do I mean by this? Well, I got some stuff underneath. What is this? You don't want to really know it real carefully, but what is this doing? What do I mean by this? When I say the generalized estimating equation. Well, how did we get going on this whole, the whole business of, you know, solving and getting a, a solution for um, a linear model or a, a, a uh, when we talked about um, uh, a generalized linear model, we talked about quasi-likely. Remember, if we knew the likelihood, if we knew the likelihood and we knew the distribution of our y, we can get a set of equations called the likelihood equations or the score equations that we could solve. If we don't know the likelihood, we can get a set of equations that use the mean and the variance, and they're called score-like equations or quasi-like equations that will, you can solve and get quasi-likelihood estimates. Now, all this is is what the quasi-likelihood equations look like when you generalize them to allow for correlated data. That's all this is. The difference between what I've written here, and I don't know if I ha even have it on this on this thing here. I guess I do. I do. No, I don't exactly have it. I do. Oh yeah, I, I do have it. Um, the difference between the multivariate GEE and the univariate quasi likelihood is this set of equations and this set of or a set of equations that have to get solved. The difference is this set of equations involve matrices. This uh, do not involve matrices. They only involve scalars. This set of equations for the GEE involve matrices. So all I'm saying here is that when you're doing generalized estimating equations, the thing that the computer has to do is solve a more complicated set of equations that are based on the fact that you have repeated measures. And again, that's built into the program. So unless you're doing theoretical work, which probably nobody in this room is doing, um, uh, and very few people in our uh, in the epidemiology department, but some people in the biostatistics department maybe do. You don't care about exactly the the details of this formula. You just I'm just trying to tell you that's the formula that the computer's solving to get your uh, quasi likelihood or what's called GE estimates when you have correlated data. Okay, so now let's see what's on there's one slide. What's on the next slide? Nothing. What does that mean? I'm finished with this one. Okay. So what I've now done, and it's 20 to 4, 
What I've now done is a very, in, a, in as quick a way as I can, I've now described what GEE is about in general. GEE, and, and what I've basically said, GEE is a way of generalizing quasi-likelihood for correlative data. And it involves solving a set of equations, and you've got correlation structures and so on. So what's next? Well, what's next is to talk about specific program, GenMod. So that's what we're now going to do. And I'm going to start doing that. It's 20 to 4. And I'm going to take about 10 minutes, and we're going to take a break. Okay. Now, before I do, did anybody want to give a presentation today about their... I'm looking over there, but I don't know if you were... Looking over there, Kristen, were you thinking, no, no, no. Shannon, what's that? After, oh, okay, after, okay, anybody? That's okay, you don't have to, but I'm looking, okay, that's okay, okay. So what I now want to do is start talking about GenMod, what that is, how it works, okay? That's what we're going to start learning how to do. Now, so GenMod is a SAS procedure that allows you to do GEE, where you've got correlated data, and you're using quasi-likelihood. And GenMod allows discrete or continuous outcomes, and it uses GEE estimation methods to fit a generalized quasi-likelihood model. This is the general way you could write the model as the inverse link. And, um, and the only assumption this is quasi-likelihood is you know something about the relationship of the variance. The variance could be written in some form with a, uh, as a, a product of a scalar and a function of the mean. And then the rest of this is saying the same thing. You can have different kinds of models, although, you see what it says here? It says, allows marginal repeated measures models and transitional models, but not random effects models. So if you're going to use GenMod, you can't do random effects. So this is going to cut out any issue if you want to do random effects, but, but you can do random effects using GlimMix. So, uh, so let's talk a little bit more about the first line. Assumes discrete or continuous outcome. Okay. For, and we're talking about correlated data. Okay. Now, we've spent up to this point in the course, or up until the previous week, talking about how to use proc mixed to fit a linear model for correlated data, right? That's what we've spent. That's what the homework assignment was about, okay? Now, what I say here is GenMod could be used to fit the screed or continuous model. So I could, what this sort of says, we focus on the continuous part. What this says is I could have used GenMod on the FEV data set or the shoulder flexion or the gaze angle data set. I didn't have to use Proc mix to do it, I could have used GenMod to do it. That's what this that's what this first line sort of essentially says. Okay. Now, the reason for GenMod is was not to provide an alternative way to deal with continuous outcomes. That's not the reason. Even though you can fit, you can use continuous whether you have continuous data or not. Okay. Whether, I'm sorry, whether you have correlated data or not. So that's not the main reason for GenMod. But I guess the question I'm asking, or asking you to think about, or I'm going to tell you the answer in a second, is if you run GenMod on the FEV data set, any of the models we, you ran for the homework assignment, or I showed you when, when, the, the, when the reference group was week five, if you ran any of those models, are you going to get different answers than if you use GenMod than if you use Mixed? So what's the answer to that? What do you think the answer to that? Will you get the same answer or different answer? How many would say, just in terms of intuition, would say it's going to be different answers? What's that? Well, okay, let's talk about fixed. You know, if you run GenMod for a fixed effect model and you run Mix for a fixed effect, effects model, let's say you're running fixed effects models in both. The same fixed effect model. Will you get the same estimated coefficients? That's what I'm asking. If you run GenMod for a marginal model, you run Mix for a marginal model. Okay, and it's the same model with the same variables in it, for, and the and the same correlation structure that you're putting in. Will you get the same estimates of the betas? 
Okay, did I focus that question down a little bit? Okay, now how many would say the answer is same? Now, when you go, you're going like this, Jake, you're going like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And why are you saying that? Because it feels good. No. But why do, why do you think it might make sense? How would you know for sure whether you were getting the same answer? I mean, what is the computer program in Nick's doing, and what is the computer program in Yenma doing to get the answer? What is it doing? Each one is doing. It's solving a set of equations, right? The set of equations when it's doing mixed is a set of score equations. Because when you're doing mixed, you're assuming you know the, the, uh, the uh, distribution is approximately normally distributed. When you're assuming gen mod, you don't assume you know it, but you're assuming you know the mean and the variance and you're dealing with a continuous model. And you get a, you get a set of equations that have to be solved. If you're doing gen mod, you get a set of equations that have to be solved. If you're using mix, you have a set of equations to be solved for a linear model. What do you think about those two sets of equations? Are they the same or different? Turns out they're going to be exactly the same. If it's a linear model, the set of score-like equations for gen mod are the score equations because it's a linear model. Turns out that way. So what it comes down to is that you, you can use gen mod to do the same thing that mix does. You can do, either one is going to give you the same set of estimated regression coefficients. Either one will do it because they're solving the same set of equations. And the reason why they're solving the same set of equations is when you're talking about a linear model, you can figure out, you know, you can figure out what the mean and the variance is for that linear model. And that turns out to be exactly the score equations, not even the score-like equations. So you're going to get exactly the same estimates. Okay, so there's no real reason to spend a lot of time talking about what you get out of gen mod if you're, doing a, if you're fitting a linear model. It's going to be the same, essentially, st stuff that you're going to get if you use mixed. Where gen mod was really kind of put forward was to deal with a situation. We had a, a nonlinear model, like a logistic model. So I'm now not going to talk about, I mean, I could, sh I could in a past pr uh, PowerPoint presentation, I had, I, I ran gen mod and mixed for the FEV data set and showed you that the estimates were the same. I'm just telling you that now. You know, do you believe me? Well, I don't know. You'll have to, you, one way you could believe, not believe me is do it yourself. Okay, but I'm just telling you it's the same. So what does it come down to here? What it comes down to is, I want to run and illustrate gen mod for a nonlinear model. And the simplest one is a logistic model and a binary logistic model for correlated data. Now, before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the syntax, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll illustrate it for this, um, this binary data set, which we've already talked about. It's the bypass data set. So that aspirin was the exposure variable. But let's just talk very quickly about the syntax. You remember the key syntax for mixed was the model statement, right? That was the key thing you had to do for me, to tell the computer what model you were using. And what you would do for mixed in the model statement had to be the fixed effects, right? You couldn't put any random effects in the model statement. When you're using gen mod, you can only use fixed effects, so that's what you put in the model statement for gen mod. And there's no random effect statement. There's no random statement, so the model statement is the key statement. When you tell the computer you, you're, you're fitting either a marginal or a conditional model, you're not fitting a random effect model. Okay, so that's the key thing. Now, then, of course, proc gen mod is key because it tells the computer what you're doing. And now, there are other things here. Now, the key other thing, there are several key things, but the other key thing is the repeated statement. Because what's the repeated statement going to do? What's the, wh why do you need a repeated statement? Because that's where you tell, now remember, there, there's no random effects. So remember we talked about an R and a G matrix? Do we have a G matrix? We only have an R matrix, right? So what is the repeated statement going to do? That's where you tell the computer what the correlation structure is, what the marginal or whatever correlation structure you want to use, even if it's transitional. That's where you tell the computer what the correlation structure is that you're going to use. That's a, so that's crucial. 
And when you do the repeated statement, you have to say subject equal to something, and the thing that's something that you have to put in here is the name of the cluster variable. If the cluster variable is an I, the ID of a, an individual person, or if it's subject, you know, sub S-U-B-J, that's what you put in here, okay? Now, there is a difference when you run GenMod and you put this repeated statement. You may not remember this, but for mixed, this subject equal to whatever the cluster variable is was on the opposite side of the um, option. It was, it was repeated. Then it was slash subject equal to subject. The, the subject statement came after the... When you're using GenMod, it becomes before. Why they did that, I don't know, but that's what you have to do. You have to do it before. If you do it afterwards, it won't work. Okay? So that's a key thing. Okay? So model statement, repeated statement. So what else? Well, what, you see these other three? These are the other three main things. Class statement is you use if you want to consider a variable that's categorical and you want to sort of have the computer define the dummy variables, right? That's what you do for a class statement. Or you can define the dummy variables yourself. That works for mix. That works for GenMod. Okay. Talk a little bit more about that sooner or later. But, um, but that's basically what the class. Then what about contrast and estimate? Why is that important? Well, when you fit the model, you want to test hypothesis and estimate parameters. Now, if it's a nonlinear model and it's a logistic model, the estimate statement will usually be, what will you be estimating? What kind of, what would the estimates look like if it's a binary logistic model? There'll be odds ratios. There'll be e to the betas, right? So you want to get an estimate for some function, e to, an e to the beta function. You have to know how to do that, but it's, it's the same, basically. And we'll, we'll look at that after the break. And the contrast statement is what you do if you want to test a hypothesis about parameters and the, the betas in the model. Or whether you want to test hypothesis about, you want to do a chunk test. You can do a contrast statement for all the interaction terms together. We talked about how to do that in proc mix. It's the same thing when you're doing um, GenMod. Okay, so that's the main thing. Uh, that's the main thing that GenMod does. Now, the only other thing we'll talk about is, and, and then I'll, st I'll stop here, is these are the correlation structures that are available in GenMod. These are the correlation structures that are available. You see it says AR and AR1, that's autoregressive, exchangeable, or compound, so two ways of saying the same thing, independent. M dependent, that's stationary. That's stationary M, unstructured. User fixed, that means you're actually going to fix the specific. These are the options you have. Now, you notice from this list, this is the whole list, unless they've changed it recently. When you're using GenMod, the list is much more narrow than it is in Mixed, much narrower. Next, I show you an appendix with a whole bunch of stuff. Glimmix is the same list as in Mixed. So that's one reason for considering Glimmix, uh, just for the, for the choice. But let's stop. It's 5 to 4, uh, 10 after 4. Okay. 10 after 4, what are we going to do? We're going to learn how to use GenMod, how you run it, how you apply it to the bypass data, the aspirin bypass data. We're going to see what the code looks like. We're going to look at some output, and we're going to do a few more things with that. That's the goal for the rest of the rest of the day. Okay? Ten after four? Is that all right? I hope so. Unless you want to not have a break and just keep going. No, come on. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Got to have a break. I have to have a break. Okay? So here we go. So, let's see, Panopto, Paul. Okay. Okay, so we're going to look at how to analyze, and this is, a, this is as nice and easy an example as I can show you, I think, how to analyze the um, aspirin heart bypass study. And when I described it initially, I talked about, again, you've got, 
got 214 patients, received up to six coronary bypass grafts. They randomly assigned to either aspirin or placebo. Um, and the outcome is whether one year later the arteries that were unblocked were blocked again or not blocked again. One blocked, zero if unblocked. So it's a binary outcome, okay? So it's correlated data because why? Why is it correlated data? We talked about this before. Why is it correlated data? Because each person in the study, each of the 214 has had at least maybe one, of, they might have had two or more bypasses. And if they've had two or more bypasses, then the outcome on each of the bypasses on the same person is correlated, right? Or you think it might be correlated because it's on the same person, okay? Now, another thing you might think about is if you talk about, the, we talked about this before, if you talk about the correlation structure, for this situation. Now, is this a longitudinal study? Well, it sort of is because you're following people for one year. But the outcome, is the outcome measured longitudinally? Well, it is and it isn't. When it's measured one year later, the different measurements on the same subject are being measured at the same time, right? So if you talk about the correlation of those measurements on the same subject at the one year later, you can't say that there, there's a time dif difference between uh, between one measurement and another measurement on the same subject. So it was all done at the same time. Okay? So if you think about the correlation structure, it doesn't make sense to think about autoregressive or even stationary because those are structures that start thinking about changing over time. So the first thing you might think about is exchangeable. For that, right? Isn't that a natural thing that you might? It doesn't mean it's the right one because there could be some other correlation structures. It might even be unstructured. It might be more complicated than exchangeable. But it makes more sense to think about exchangeable than autoregressive or state. Autoregressive and stationary don't, don't really make sense here. Okay. So, um, so, uh, but now, how do you do this? Okay. Well, the outcome is zero one. So. Um, we're going to do a logistic regression model. That's what we're going to do. It's binary outcome. And uh, the variables, um, well, I haven't mentioned any of the other variables, but um, the additional covariates were age and years, gender, weight, and height. Okay. And in terms of the example, uh, this example, I'm going to consider two correlation structures. I could have considered unstructured, but I'm not. In fact, if I considered unstructured, which I could, and you could, because this data set's on the, on the computer. If I consider it unstructured for this data set, what might you think would happen, even though it might not happen? You remember, if you look at the data set, again, 214 patients received up to six coronary bypasses. Is this a balanced data set or an unbalanced data set? Unbalanced. So you automatically may expect something that if you used unstructured, not there, it could run. You might be lucky to have it run, but it could, may not run. If that's the case, you can't even try unstructured, okay? Um, uh, there are other things you could do. You could say, well, uh, up to six colony by, maybe I'll try to get a subset of the data set where everybody's had the same number of observations at the same time and try to see what I get out of that. Some people might be doing that for their projects. If they have an unbalanced one to start with and they want to try to get a balanced one, that could be something to consider, but you really have an unbalanced data set, so you want to look at that for sure. Okay, so what do we do? Okay, now here's a model. Model one, an interaction model. Okay, and then there's a no interaction model. Okay, so these are two models. Okay, the interaction model is allowing the possibility that the effect of aspirin differs depending upon the covariates that they want to control for, right? And the no interaction model doesn't have these product terms in there. So if you wanted to test a hypothesis about whether there's interaction or not, how would you do that? What's the null hypothesis? Just stating that. Without even knowing about how to exactly do it, what would you do? Would be the coefficient of the product terms, beta 6, 7, 8, and 9 are all equal to 0, right? That's the null hypothesis. And the model would reduce to the no interaction model. Okay. 
how do you think you would do that test? What would you use? How would you do that test using GenMod based on what I sort of said said here? What's the what's the um, the code that, the syntax in the code that lets you test? Contrast. So you'd use a contrast statement to do it. Okay. Now we'll look at that. Okay. I'm just saying. Okay. Now suppose you did that test, and we're going to find out when we did that test it was non-significant, and so we reduced the model to this model. Okay. So suppose we wind up with this model. If we fit this model, okay, it's a logistic regression model, okay, and it's a logistic regression model for correlated data. But if we fit this model and we got estimates, even taking into account whatever correlation structure, say exchangeable, that we use, we're going to get estimates for each of these coefficients, right? And if we wanted, to, if we decided that we wanted to keep all the variables, age, gender, weight, and height, all the control variables, the potential compounders in the model, now we could still argue about that, like we did in 740, and decide to drop some. But if we keep all four, sort of using the gold standard model in terms of terminology that we use. What would be the formula for the effect of aspirin? What would be the formula you'd compute? E to the beta. So it's the same thing. In other words, it's correlated data, okay? And you'd be using GenMod to do this because it's correlated data. You could also use GlimMix, but we're not into that at this point. You could use GenMod to do this. And if you fit GenMod, you'd get estimates of these things. The estimates would account for the correlation somehow, exchangeable, whatever you decided to use. But once you got the estimates, you'd get est you know, estimates of each one of them, and e to the beta 1 would be the estimate of the aspirin, the effect of the aspirin variable. And whether that's significant or not, I mean, that was the study question. Study question is, does aspirin sort of reduce the, the number of arteries that get, block, uh, arteries that get blocked. So the, the, does it, are there, if you use aspirin, are, are there a lot more um, uh, unblocked arteries than if, you, if you, than if you don't use aspirin? So you would get the odds ratio, you test whether it's significant or not, get a confidence interval, and there you go, okay? So that's how you do it. So it's not that much different than what we did in 740, but now we're just doing correlation structure. So, okay, so now let's talk about some of this. So this is the first slide that I'm going to show you, but we've already sort of talked about this idea. I want to, so I want to talk about contrast and estimate statements in GenMod, okay? So the first thing I say is you do not need a contrast statement to test. Now, by the way, do you have this slide on your screen? Do you have a different slide? Because I just put up a new version of what was previously there that has this. The previous one had something called a heartburn data set. If you, if you haven't changed it, I've, right now on the current version of Blackboard is what's up here is something for the bypass study. Because that's what we're talking about. I got rid of the other thing. Okay, so, okay, so I said, do you not need a contrast statement to test for an overall effect of a variable listed as a fixed effect in the model statement as either a single variable or a class variable? And I said, well, all test results are automatically output for each single variable listed in the results for, uh, for analysis of GE parameter estimates. Wall tests are also computed if the option slash type 3 wall is added prior to the semicolon. Okay, now, let me show you. Um, this. Look, let's look at this code. Okay. What is, what's written here? Proc gen mod data equal to aspirin B. So that's the name of the data set. Descending. Okay. That's to make sure that um, the, uh, the value for the aspirin of one is the one that's being predicted because one is the used aspirin. And you expect the odds ratio if you used aspirin to be would you expect the odds ratio if you used aspirin to be larger than one or less than one? If aspirin is protecting blockage, preventing blockage, and aspirin at value of one, would you expect larger than one or less than one? Less than one, right? Because if it's protective, you expect the odds ratio to be under one. So that's the odds ratio we're getting. Well, we haven't seen it. I haven't shown you on this slide, but look at this. It says, and then it says class ID, 
And then it's got model occluded equal aspirin one slash distribution equal to BIN. It's got something with, uh, I've got a circle, uh, a red circle around it with an arrow, semicolon, then I've got repeated subject equal ID slash type equal exchange will run. So what is this doing? What is this doing? It's running a model with what variables and how many variables are in this model? One, right? Just the aspirin variable. It's, not le it's leaving out all the other variables, right? Aspirin variable is the only variable in the model, okay? Okay, and you notice that this variable is listed, this is as a fixed effect in the model statement. So if I want to test a hypothesis about this, I don't need to run to actually have a contrast statement. That's what I'm saying. I don't need to have, to have a contrast statement to be able to do a test. I would do, have to do it if I had um, this variable, um, uh, if I had more than one variable that I wanted to test for, uh, for some effect, but I don't have to do it in this case, okay? Now you notice it says, you see it says, include aspirin one slash D-I-S-T equal B-I-N. What's that doing? What's that doing? That's telling the program what model are you gonna use? By BIN stands for binomial or point binomial, okay? Now you notice what you don't see is link equal to logit, right? You don't see that, okay? The reason why you don't see that here is if you write DIST equal to BIN, it's already assumed that the link is logit. That's what the default thing is. But you can always put that in, B, D, this equal BIN link equal logit. I'm not sure if you say link equal logit and you don't say this distribution equal binomial, that'll work. But if you say BIN distribution equal binomial and you leave out link equal logit, you're fine. It's gonna do logistic regression. Got it? Okay. So, and then I say repeated subject, repeated subject equal ID. You notice the statement subject equal to ID is on the left of the option sign. Not on the right, on the, it was on the right when you were using proc mix, okay? Okay, so um, now it says subject equal ID, okay? And you notice uh, uh, the there's a class variable. Why does ID have to be a class variable? Why does ID have to be a class variable? Same thing when you're running mixed, because the cluster variable when you're running a correlated data thing, has to be defined as a class variable. That's why you have to say class ID. Whether you say some other variable is a, um, is a class variable, that's different. But you have to have the ID variable being a class variable. Got that? Okay. So, uh, and then you have to say subject equal ID because you have to tell the computer that um, what the cluster variable is, and you have to make that cluster variable a class variable. Then it says slash type equal changeable, so you're using exchangeable run. So that's what you get when you, that's what this code says. And here's the output for this code, okay? Now, the output for this code is now, now you notice that uh, what I put over here is I'm, I'm saying, suppose I ran this code and I didn't use the statement type three wall. I didn't use the statement, I just ran the code DIST equal to BIN semicolon. This is what I'd get, okay? And you notice that what I get is I get coefficient of the intercept and the, these are the only two parameters in the model. They're standard errors, they're confidence intervals, and I get a, a Z test, okay? A Z test. Um, it's the wall test, okay? I'm not getting a score test because the wall tests are automatically output for each single variable. That's why I'm getting a, a, a wall. That's why I'm getting a wall test. It's a it's a z statistic, but it's not a score test. Okay. If I want to make this a chi-square statistic, what would I have to do? Square it. It would be chi-square with one. Either way, I could do it. In fact, if I did, if I did write, um, I think if I wrote type three walled, I either get exactly the same, um, exactly the same thing, or I'd get another box like I've got below here, that would also give me the wall test, that, the test which, have, which would have 9.13 times squared is 80, 
81 or 82, or I'm not sure what, what that is. Okay. Now look at the difference between this code and this code below. What's the difference? What's the difference? This code, now I'm assuming this code doesn't have it in here, but if it had it in there, I'd be getting, everything would be wall. But you notice here it says type three. It doesn't say type three wall, it says type three. If you write type three, what are you getting? Score test, because there it is. Okay. So the score statistic turns out to be chi-square was 65.5, and the wall statistic is 81 or 80-something. 80 okay. Not the same number. So you notice the wall and the, and the score test aren't the same. right? They're not necessarily going to be the same. So they're both going to say significant, so it doesn't matter in terms of whether you're saying this is just the crude model. So I haven't controlled for anything, but it looks like regardless of which, which whether I use the wall, I get the same conclusion that without these other variables, there's a crude effect of aspirin, right? So I've just done that. Now, one other thing I should tell you about, and this is something Zach and I talked about during our Tuesday meeting that we had every Tuesday before class. Now, you see it says class ID, okay? What if I had put class ID and I had a space and then I had added aspirin one in addition to the ID? What if I said class ID space and I added aspirin one? What would I be doing? What would I be doing? I'd be adding, I'd be defining aspirin one as a class variable, right? Here, I'm not defining aspirin 1 as a class variable. I'm just using it however it's coded. I mean, it's coded, and I'm not showing you the whole, um, uh, what do you call it, um, code. Uh, but uh, this is now, without, um, without uh, aspirin 1 in here, I'm actually getting, um, uh, um, um, without that, this is being treated as a binary variable zero one, and it's not a class variable. It's only one of two values it's going to get. Once I put this in, I'm putting it in as a as a as a class variable. Now, one thing that happens, uh, and um, that Zach is going to write about and send you uh, a. Um, I guess it's going to be a power. Is it going to be a? It's either going to be a word file or a PowerPoint presentation or both, I'm not sure. But he's going to show you that if you actually put in ID aspirin 1 as a class variable, some things don't work the way they should work. And I, I was surprised at that because I thought it wouldn't matter. He said whether it's a class variable or not, it would still be treated as bino binomial. But he's going to send you something. to What I'm worried about, what I'm worried, the reason why I'm telling you this is because when you do your project, if you have a variable like aspirin one that's a binary variable and you put it in the cl as a class statement, uh, something might not come out right. And he's going to explain that in his um, handout. And probably try to explain it again, maybe even in your next meeting, which will be on March the 14th, right? That's your next uh, lab. But we'll see. Maybe you don't have to if you, everything works out. So anyhow, okay, so there you go. This is, so this is the first statement. So now let's go on to the next thing. Contrast statements can be used for hypothesis testing. And now I've said there are certain situations you don't have to use contrast statements. Whoops. Here. If, if, the, if the variable that you're trying to test about is actually in the model either by itself or as a class variable. But if it's not that way, there are two types of contrast statements. One is testing a hypothesis about the significance of an odds ratio estimate, which would be in the form, if it's a logistic model, it's an e to the beta thing, right? So logistic model, the odds ratio estimates are e to the beta type of things. Could be just e to the beta one, it could be e to the beta one plus some other terms, depending on whether there's interaction in there, okay? And it also could be testing hypothesis involving a chunk test that considers several variables simultaneously, at least two of which are not class variables. Okay, so for example, let's look at this number two statement here. Go back to this. So suppose I wanted to test for interaction. 
interaction. Okay. Now, is the, if I run this model, put these variables in the model, okay, am I going to get automatically a chunk test for interaction? That's what I'm asking you. Will I automatically get a chunk test for, inter for interaction? The reason why I'm not is because these interaction terms are all being put in there separately by themselves. There's not one variable that's sort of defining the combination of all, which, which you, you can't really easily have here. So they're all separate product terms in there. So I'm gonna, if I want to test for interaction, I'm going to have to have a contrast state. So we'll see what that looks like shortly. Now, if I also want to test a hypothesis about an odds ratio, whether it has interaction or not, then I also do this using a contrast statement. But the, the contrast statements look differently. So let's look at this thing. So um, in any case, so there's two ways to test hypothesis. One is about an odds ratio in a model, and the other is about a chunk, doing a chunk test. One is an odds ratio. It's not a chunk test. You've, you've got a model. You, you've got a, you want to compute an odds ratio from the model. You want to test whether it's significant. This thing says you want to do a chunk test for several variables in the model. If you're doing contrast statements in proc gen mod, the default test is a score test. The score test is what you automatically get. A wall test requires you're adding something that says, I want to do a wall test. Now, of the different tests, what did I say? The score test is better. So, so, uh, so contrast and estimate statements work the same way in Glimix they, that they do in gen mod. However, Glimix has an extra feature called code test. We'll describe that later. Okay, so now, okay, here's, here's a model. Let's look at this model. And, okay, so here's a model that has aspirin, age, gender, weight, and height, the four covariates in the model, no interactions, okay? And for this model, the odds ratio of, for the effect of aspirin, the aspirin variable, is either the beta, right? That's the formula for it. And if you want to test for it, the, the test is that this odds ratio is equal to one. So what would I have to do, okay? Well, um, one thing I could do is I could do the following. If I do this, if I go proc gen mod data, all of this model Q occluded, I've got the aspirin, there's four variables, DIST equal to binomial, I don't need the length function, and then I could repeated subject equal ID type, just like I did before. Car W, what's that going to do? What's car W going to do if I leave that in? Just like similar in um, mix, but in, in mix it would be car R. It's going to give you the estimated exchangeable correlation structure from your data. It will give you the, ex uh, now th that's a question because this is an unbalanced data set. So you got people in the study who've had five bypasses, people who have six bypasses, people who have two bypasses. So this is going to give you an estimated correlation structure. For who? Which of, which of the subjects, in the, there's 214 subjects, some of whom had two bypasses, some of you had five. Which subject is, which, what correlation structure is it going to give you? Is it going to give you a two by two correlation matrix or four by four? Which one is it going to give you? Well, if you read the, read the directions, it's going to give you the correlation structure for the first person in your data set. If the first person in the data set had four repeats, four, um, not repeats, four, well, four bypasses, yeah, four repeats, four bypasses, it'll give you a four by four correlation matrix. The first person was six, it'll give you a six by six. It won't do the tenth person, it's always the first person. But if it's exchangeable, you're okay. Once you see whether it's four by four or six by six, that correlation that you're gonna get, it's gonna be the same number, whether it's four by four, six by six, so you know what it is, okay? Now, when I write contrast OR aspirin, this is where I, this is my label telling me what I'm getting, and then I write aspirin one, one, and I write this thing, you notice that I don't have anything that says slash wall, so I'm actually asking the program to give me a contrast, uh, a test of hypothesis for what? What am I asking? What is this question asking? What, what am I getting a test for? Well, if I say aspirin one, one, and this is the model, okay, okay, and I say that, what am I testing? I'm testing whether 
this odds ratio is equal to one, this odds ratio is equal to one, because that's the odds ratio in this model for that, that exposure barrel, that exposure, that's what I'm testing. Okay, so that's what this is. If I wanted to test whether the gender variable odds ratio is equal to one, how would I change this? Well, I might change the label to OR gender, and I might say gender one, right? Gender is a binary variable. I've got to be a little careful about age because age is a continuous variable. How do I do that? But, but, but that's how I do it. And here's the output. See this output? 65.34. Now, is that the same number as... Whoop. Wait a second. Which, I'm going the wrong way. Well, 65.5. Oh. Um... Exactly the same, but I'm surprised. But in any case, oh, I know why. Because this model only has aspirin in it and has it doesn't have any other variables. And this model has aspirin and four other variables. So I'm not expecting to get the but but I got almost the same score test as I got previously when I only had aspirin in there. So what do I conclude from this about in this no interaction model whether there's a significant effect of the aspirin? The answer is yes, right? That's provided this no interaction model is appropriate. And in order to see whether it's appropriate, I should have first done a chunk test for interaction. But I'm showing you this in sort of a reversed order. And I'm showing you that I did a score test because the score test is the default. If I wanted to do a wall test, I have slash walled here, and I'd get a walled statistic instead. Follow me? Not hard, I don't think. OK. Now, let's look at this. Whoa. Okay. The model I'm now dealing with is the interaction model. Okay? The interaction model. Okay? And for this model, this interaction model, you see underneath the model, you see this statement? The statement? That's the formula for the odds ratio for what? This is just going back to 740. It's the odds ratio for the effect of aspirin in a model in which there's interaction of aspirin with the other four variables, right? So it's got the coefficient of the aspirin variable, and it's got the coefficients of um, it's got the coefficients of all the other product terms in the model times whatever the value is of that of that um, of the part of the product term that has to do with the interaction part, the the um, what do you call it, the W term. So the OR is beta, delta 1 A's, plus delta 2 gender, plus that with delta 1 through delta 4 are the coefficients of the product terms. And if I particularly wanted to um, get the, in, um, and that, that's an odds ratio. That's not a, that's, that's just a, that, that's going to, if I plug in values for age, gender, weight, and height, like 41, 75, and 100, I'm getting an expression for the odds ratio. I'm getting a single number once I fit this model for what that odds ratio for somebody who's 40 years old is, I don't know whether this is male or female, 75 kilograms, height 170 centimeters. I'm going to get the, and, and if I, if I want to do a test for this, the test is whether this odds ratio is equal to one. I might also want to get a confidence interval around this odds ratio. Now, look at the code here. Look at the code over here. Now, you notice it says contrast. So what does that mean I'm doing? Test or an estimate? Doing a test. Contrast means test. Okay? Okay. Then I got OR 4175. One, so why did I do that? That's the label. I'm just telling myself what I'm testing. Okay? It's, it has to do with this particular specification. Then I got aspirin 1. Aspirin 1 star age 40 because that's the value of age. Aspirin 1 star gender times 1, that's the value of the gender. Aspirin 1 times weight, 75. Aspirin 1 times high, 100. This is the same thing as you did way back when for 740. It's not any different. Except now I said contrast and I said slash walled. So what am I getting? What am I getting? I'm getting a wall test. Okay. And you notice that 
I'm just getting the contrast. I'm not getting the estimate of the odds ratio. I'm just saying whether this particular odds ratio that I might want to focus on, given that I've got a model of interaction, which I might not really have. I don't really have these interaction terms really drop out. But that's the odds ratio formula. That's the odds ratio formula. And is it significant? And the answer is yes. And you see it says wall because I wrote this. Okay. If I left this off, it would be score because that's the default. Okay. So I'm just showing you what you get out of it. Okay. There's, there's more. I'm just trying to explain how it works. Okay. Okay. Now, Glimix isn't that much different, but, there, but Glimix doesn't let you have a, I mean, Glimix lets you have a G matrix and a difference with an R matrix. Now, let's look at um, the chunk test thing. Now, let's go to this code at the bottom of the screen. Okay. Look at the code at the bottom of the screen. Data equal aspirin, class ID, model. And this model has all those product terms in there. It's the, it's the interaction model. Then I say repeated subject ID, type equal exchange with car W. Then look what I've done here. What am I testing here? What am, what, this is a contrast statement, so it's a test. How does that test differ from this test? This is the test about a given odds ratio. What's this test? It's a chunk test for all the interactions. How do you know it's a chunk test? It's the same thing we saw when we were doing proc mix. See the commas? Aspen one star age, comma. Aspen one times, times gender, com one, comma. That's why it's a chunk test. And it's a chunk test for these four interaction terms that I'm basically saying I'm setting them equal to zero. That's what I'm, I'm saying. Are they all the same and equal to, and equal to zero? So, and it's, it's, it's a score test because I didn't say slash wall. I have the score test. So that's how you do the score test. Okay. That's the code for it. Now let's see what I get. Okay. I run this model. I just put everything here. The score test default. When I run this model, I get all the, this is the, this is the output for the model when I run it that has nothing to do with the contrast statement. This is the model that I get when I just run this model and I ignore the contrast statement. It gives me all the information and all this stuff are wall statistics because that's the default thing when I'm running the model. But on the next slide, I get the score statistic. And the score statistic is that auto, will get printed out, not automatically, will get printed out because of this statement. The score test is... It's a chi-square with 3.66, the degrees of freedom 4, and that's the chi-square. So what about the test for interaction? Not significant, right? Now, that's why I dropped the four interaction terms. Should I have done that? If I really was following EPI 740, what we recommended in EPI 740, if I was really doing diligent work on this thing, what should I actually do? That's the chunk test for interaction. What I should probably do is go backwards, see if I can drop all four. Maybe an interaction story stay, stays in once I've dropped two or three of them. So I really want to go backwards, but I'm just sort of short-circuiting it just to show you that this is the chunk test. It was not significant. I, I'm, I actually didn't check the others, but I'm saying uh, I think it turned out I may have checked it sometime or other, but it might have been 10 years ago, so I'm not sure. So anyhow, I dropped the interaction term. Now, so go back to this, now, now, um, now for this model, for this model, okay, now you notice that this is the statement, the one, the commas, okay, now here's this other statement, okay, here's this other statement, it says estimate, okay, this is an estimate statement. I previously showed you two slides ago a contrast statement, now I'm showing you an estimate statement. Down here, see this estimate? Aspirin one, age times 40. So what am I estimating? What am I estimating? I'm not testing, I'm estimating. I'm getting an odds ratio in this interaction model where I've got uh, 40 for age, one for gender, 75 for weight, and 170 for height, and that's the code I use 
And when I actually think about what the, what the output was, what the output was when I think of these coefficients, you see the coefficient of the Aspen variables, 0.3934. You see the 0.3934 over here? And you see the 0.0069, it goes back to this. These are all coefficients of the interaction terms. Okay, I'm not sure if you're following me, but that's what's being estimated. And if I actually actually let the computer do the work for me, this is what I get for that odds ratio, 0.2794, and that's what I get for the confidence interval. Now, I'm just showing you the answer, but here's the code. Here's the code that I did for this. This is exactly the code that I would get. You see the points 2794? And you see the point 2794? And the point 1520 and so on? That's what I would get if I run this. Okay. And what this is, is it's the um, it's e to the beta, where beta is, uh, it's not e to the beta, it's e to a set of coefficients which involved not only the coefficient of the aspirin variable, but the coefficient of, of the product terms times their um, effect modifiers. And that's what I get when I do this. So I can use an estimate statement to get an odds ratio of interest, even if it's an interaction model. Questions on this? Now, this is one of these things where you have to play with this and work with it to do it. So I'm just showing you this. It's sort of... You know, if you got a question, you could stop me and do it. But okay, so let's let's look here now. Okay, another model. Okay, here's a no interaction model. Okay, a no interaction model. Now, here's a no interaction model. Now, for this model, I've got age, gender, weight, height, aspirin one. Got everything like I had before, and I've got contrast aspirin aspirin one one, estimate aspirin one one, exp. So what's this doing? What's the contrast statement doing? What's, tell me what the contrast statement's doing. It's testing in this model. What is it testing? Can you tell me what it's testing? It's testing whether beta 1 in this model is 0 or whether e to the beta 1 is 1. That's what it's testing. That's what this contrast statement is testing. Is that showing up over here? No, because this is just the fit of the model. This is just what happens when you run this model. These are the coefficients that you get, and this happens to be the coefficient of the aspirin variable. Now, you see it says estimate aspirin, aspirin 1, 1, EXP. So what is this doing? What's the difference between this statement and this statement? The one on the bottom, one on the top is testing for the odds ratio. One on the bottom is estimating the odds ratio, getting the estimate and its confidence interval. Okay. Now, this isn't the estimate and its confidence interval because this is beta. It's not e to the beta. Okay. So in order to get the estimate for the odds ratio and its confidence interval, this doesn't do it. So in fact, on this slide, somewhere over here, well, let's see. See where it says estimate, um, estimate aspirin, the answer was 0.264, and I can actually get that on the next slide. See 0.264, see estimate, aspirin, aspirin 1, 1, 0.264, that's the estimate that I get when I run this code without the, con without the contrast statement. That's the same number that I have up here. And the wall test, if I go contrast, now let's see what I wrote here. I wrote... I wrote contrast, so this is asking for a score test. If I write contrast aspirin, aspirin 1 walled, I'm getting the wall test. If I write contrast aspirin, aspirin 1 1, I'm getting the score test. Right? Isn't that what that says? So this was the walled statistic, 9 point something squared, and this was the, the score statistic. They're not exactly the same. Okay? Because I'm these two things give me something different. So I can do one or the other. I would ideally want to do the score test. Okay, now let's see if there's, so, so I just showed you that. Let's see if there's anything else. Okay, I'm, I'm almost done with this part. Okay, now what's this? What's this? It says exchangeable working correlation. What is it? 
See, it says row hat equal to minus 0 0.0954. What's that? Well, we've just run a model. We assumed that there was an exchangeable correlation structure in the model. And this is the estimate of that, car of that common correlation. It's even slightly negative. But it's, you see how small it is, 0 0.09, 0 0.1? It's a very slow correlation. Okay. But anyhow, that's the estimate of it that you would get automatically of the correlation structure if you say, if you say, um, if you say car W. Car W is giving me this. C-O-R-W. Okay. What's the next thing here? Well, see S-L-R, naive model. So what did I do here? What's this? What do I mean by the naive model? I also ran the model assuming everything was independent. Okay. I didn't put exchangeable. I put, this is the no interaction model, but I didn't use a repeated statement. Okay, I just ran the no interaction model. I assumed everything was independent. This is what I got. Okay. Now you notice the coefficient of the aspirin variable is minus 1.34. Okay. So if I want it in this naive model, independence, if I get, want to get the odds ratio under independence, for the odds ratio, what is it? It's e to the minus 1.34, 1, 1.0, right? Which turns out to be 0.26. If I go to the actual model, where I actually have um, exchangeable in here, I get 0.2644, which rounds off to 0.26. So what you can see is, in this particular case, for this particular, even though you can argue that there, there looks like there should be correlated data, correlation is negligible and it doesn't make any difference. Okay. And that may be something you get in your project. And if you get that in your project, you're saying, well, what are you saying? Well, what if this happened? You did this project and you wound up getting these results. What would you do? Well, the main thing is making a decision about the effect of aspirin. And the decision you'd make is that it didn't matter whether I used exchangeable or independence. I'm getting the same answer for the odds ratio and whether it's significant or not. Okay, th these two confidence intervals are essentially the same. Right? Doesn't matter. You know, not only that, it looks like I didn't really need to use a correlation structure. Okay. But if I didn't try the correlation structure and compare it to independent, I wouldn't have known that. So that's why these programs are there. It doesn't mean you're always going to get the same answer as independent. In this case, you did. You follow me? This is just a simple analysis of this. Okay. So, okay, now it's 10 of 5. So now I want to talk about, I want to segue into something. We're still using GenMod. Okay, still using GenMod. And I'm not going to go all the way through. We're going to leave early, but I'm going to take... 10 or 15 minutes to talk about this, but we'll leave before, at least 10 minutes before 520, because you want to go on vacation, even though you're not going on vacation, and I want to go on vacation, even though I'm not, okay? So, anyhow. Now, there, in GenMod, there's an alternative way to run GenMod, alternative way to consider the correlations in your data when you're talking about a logistic model, it's only, and particularly a binary logistic model. It's called the alternating logistic regression or ALR approach, okay? That's what it's called, okay? Now, it models the association between pairs of responses with log odds ratios instead of with correlations as ordinary GEEs usually do. So what do I mean by that? There's some fancy, little, little fancy math over here, or something that I, I need to explain a little bit. Okay, now let's suppose you have this situation, now follow me here. Suppose you're doing, like in this, um, in this um, uh, aspirin study, the outcome zero, one. Okay, suppose you have an individual, okay, an individual who has six bypasses, okay, Okay, and each, on each of those six bypasses, when you follow them one year later, they're going to get either a zero or one, depending upon whether they were blocked or unblocked. 
So you're gonna have six zero one scores, right? On e on that person. Okay. Now suppose you add you suppose you say, let's focus on the there's six bypasses in the person. Let's focus on the one here and the one here. I don't know where, the, where they are. Okay, one here and the one here. Okay? Okay. And let's say these are the two that were closest together in the body. I don't know. I mean, there's more over there. Well, there's, I don't know where they are. Okay. okay. So the two adjacent ones. Okay. And we want to talk about their relationship. I mean, the two adjacent, the, what we might think, even though we saw it looks like the, they were looked like they were fairly things were fairly independent. But let's say we were worried about the fact that it's the same person. So if we're looking at two bypasses, the, the two adjacent bypasses on a given person, um, one of them is going to be the zero on the first one, and one of them is going to be zero one, and the other is going to be zero one. So you're going to get a table. If you think about the uh, the outcome for the first per, for that for those two bypasses, isn't it a two by two table? If you think about the first of the bypasses, it's either one or zero. And you think about the second of the bypasses, it's either one or zero. If you say let's put the first one on the rows and the second bypass on the columns, you're getting a two by two matrix which has zeros and ones in it, right? That's what you're doing. Now, um, there's no guarantee you would have zeros and one. I mean, well, it would either be a zero or one. Okay. Now, when you have um, a two by two matrix with zeros and ones in there, okay, what do you usually think? Of, it's a two by two matrix. You usually think, and, and you're dealing with a categorical variable. What do you usually compute that measures the association between what happens at the on one versus what? What do you usually use? Do you use a correlation? What do you typically use? Some measure of effect, like an odds ratio. So you might say, if the outcome zero and one, zero or one, and I have it on this bypass and this bypass on the same person, and I got a two by two table that describes that, maybe what I'd like to say is something about the odds ratio that relates. For all people, for the first and the second adjacent ones, what the what the uh, relation, what the association is between the first and second on everybody, and that would be a there'd be a zero one on the row, zero one, but there'd be numbers in the cells. I can get an odds ratio expression. Okay, so if I get an odds ratio expression, I'm not talking about a correlation. I'm talking about an odds ratio expression. So this method called the alternating logistic regression approach says. He say, says, hey, wait a second. Maybe we shouldn't be dealing with correlation structures. We should be dealing with odds ratio structures when we have binary outcomes. You get what I'm only, It only works with binary outcomes. It certainly doesn't work with count uh, outcomes. And but with more than binary, it's more complicated than that. But with binary outcomes, the whole approach that these people came up with was why don't we just consider an odds ratio structure, not a correlation structure, and say, let's run the program and guess at what the odds ratio structure is, not the correlation structure is. Okay. Now, one odds ratio structure that you might think about that's similar to exchangeable correlation structures that the odds ratios between the first and the second bypass and the first and the third bypass and the second and the third and so on, they're all the same. So what would that be called? That would be an exchangeable correlation structure? No, it would be called an exchangeable odds ratio structure. Okay. So there's a way using GenMod, you can specify a way to test or to fit a model with a, an exchangeable odds ratio structure. Not an exchangeable, you can also do it using an exchangeable correlation structure. Now I'm going to show you how it works. Okay, I'm going to show you the code for that rather than get into all, all this here. I'll show you the code for this. Look at what I've done over here. On, on this, I've skipped a couple of pages. Look at, look at this code. This says ALR. ALR stands for Alternate Logistic Regression Approach Example Heart Bypass Study. Okay, look at the code. Proc gen mod, data equal aspirin, should have been aspirin B, but I added aspirin. Class ID, model, 
same variables, there's no interaction model, distribution binomial, repeated subject equal ID, slash, what did I write here? Is that type equal exchangeable? No, in fact, if you look at the next slide, look here, type equal exchangeable. You see this slide? This is the usual approach with an exchangeable correlation structure. If I want to consider the possibility that maybe I ought to be working with odds ratios because it's bin binomial or zero one things that I'm talking about, maybe I should use this thing. Maybe I should, I should use a log odds ratio. I could assume that, okay, I'm dealing with odds ratios. I want to see if the odds ratios are exchangeable. It doesn't matter whether they're dealing with the odds ratio of the first with the second, the first with the third, the second with the third, and so on. This tests whether the odds ratio is actually it's the log odds ratios. Well, if the log odds ratio is exchanged, if the log of the odds ratio is the same, then the odds ratio is the same, right? Right? The log of the odds ratio is some number, then the odds ratio is e to that, so that's going to be the same. So this is called the log odds ratio approach because when you write the code, you have to say something about what you think the log odds ratio is. Okay. So I wrote log odds ratio. And here I got a model. Now, if you look at what's on this slide, now I don't have them both on the same slide, but you see the coefficient minus 1.3253? See that coefficient? Okay. I look at the next slide, minus 1.3302. Okay. That's what you, we saw before. It's not the same number, right? In fact, all these other numbers are different. They're not much different. Okay. And they might not be much different. They might be, they might not be, depending upon your data, okay? In this case, they're not that much different, okay? So when I, in fact, when I fit this model, you notice the coefficient of the aspirin variable for this thing. You see, I got a Z statistic over here. This is a wall test, 9.18. What do I have on the next slide? 9.21, minus 9.21, minus 9.18, well, Virtually the same thing. So whether I use the log OR approach or the usual approach where I'm dealing with correlation doesn't seem to make a difference here. Okay. It might make a, make a difference with a different data set. It doesn't make a difference here. But I'm just trying to show you that this is another approach that a lot of people like this because it's saying if it's binary, why don't you use odds, odds ratio instead of correlation structure? So, um, so um, now... Another thing to point out is you see where it says intercept, aspirin, age, gender, weight, height, alpha 1. See that alpha 1? I go to the next slide. Intercept, aspirin, age, gender, weight, height. There's no alpha 1. There's no alpha 1 here on the one, the usual one. But when I use, when I do the um, log OR approach, alpha 1 is the estimate of the log odds ratio. You get that. It prints it, prints it out. So I can actually exponentiate that and get the odds ratio, the exchangeable odds ratio that I'm assuming is going on is 0 0.6240, 0 0.6240. That's an odds ratio, okay? It's an odds ratio, it's less than one, right? It means that um, uh, it's a negative, it's a pr protective effect, okay? Now, um, uh, I showed you the odds ratio previously for See this one, minus 0.0954? You notice it's not an odds ratio. It's correlation. And it's negative, right? It's negative 0.09. So the minus 0.0954 is a negative correlation. This is a negative odds ratio. I mean, in a sense, it's negative. The odds ratios are never negative. They're always either less than one or greater than one. So they're both sort of saying the same thing, but they're not saying. In fact, it turns out it doesn't really matter here. It doesn't really matter in this case. But that's how you could run this thing. Now, it also, when I run this thing, um, uh, OK, I'm actually now showing you those two correlation structures together on the same page. Okay, the exchangeable correlation structure is minus 0.0954, and the exchangeable odds ratio structure is 0.6240. Okay. And they're almost giving you the same thing, except that um, this is a correlation, this is an odds ratio. So these are two ways of doing the analysis. In GenMod, 
Genmod has a whole list of how to do this ALR approach. Exchangeable is the easiest one. It's not the only one, though. There's several others. There's something called full cluster. Well, full cluster is actually unstructured. Full cluster is the ALR approach of doing unstructured. And you say log OR equal full cluster, and it does unstructured for odds ratios. It assumes you have an odds ratio structure that's all different. All the odds ratios are different, rather than they're all the same. And there are some other ones. Well, I gave an example of full cluster here. This is where you notice alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4, alpha 5. All these alphas represent different parameters, and they're all different. So this is an unstructured odds ratio structure. The log OR matrix is unstructured because they're all different whatever that, if you, if you do that. So there are lots of other ones here. In fact, um, I think what I'm going to do is, this is where I'm going to sort of stop here, but there's another one called ZREP that I'm going to, I want to talk about next time. Yeah. After which I'll stop because what I want to illustrate is not this one, this one. This is something that one of your former students in this class, two, two students who got their PhDs in epidemiology had this structure where they had 30 observations per subject. And um, as far as they were concerned, it was, it was longitudinal. It was an, an environmental study. And they had a 30 by 30 correlation structure. And they wanted to consider using an odds ratio structure that was also 30 by 30. And they did this. So what I want to do at the beginning of class next time, but not now, is explain what, what is this? What did they do? And this was, this was the most, um, I don't know what the word should be, but it was the most labor-intensive thing that anybody ever did on a project in the history of this course, but uh, doing this thing. So they, they used the log odds ratio with, with this, and they got an answer that they, they liked. So um, that made sense. So anyhow. The message is there is this thing called the log odds ratio structure, and you can do a lot of different things. I've illustrated the simplest one. This is one of the more complicated ones, and I'll talk about that. But once I finish talking about that, what we're going to do next time, next time is March 15th. What are we going to talk about next time? Other than just rehashing some things about GenMod, what we're going to do next time is talk about GlimMix and what that's all about. So I've more or less talked about GenMod, although I want to illustrate this. Then we're going to talk about GlimMix. And uh, you know, then once we do that, you're going to be almost there, ready to do a lot of your project. After we talk about GlimMix, we're also going to talk about multi-level and how that fits into all this. So that's where we're going. Okay. And you're at the point where if you understand everything more or less up to this point, you can do these other things. You need to know something about the code and all that. But we're done. Okay. So, and it is not quite 10 after, and you certainly did enough. So there you go.